Welcome to the SEI podcast series, a production of Carnegie Mellon University's Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the Department of Defense. A transcript of today's podcast will be available at sei.cmu.edu forward slash podcasts. My name is Eileen Rubel, and I'm the technical lead for the SEI's Agile and Government program. Today, I'm pleased to welcome you to a roundtable discussion about the risk management framework and how it works into Agile and DevOps. I'm going to have my colleagues introduce themselves and tell a little bit about their role at the SEI and their work, and then we'll delve into our subject matter for the day. Tim? So my name is Tim Chick. I work for CERT's Security Automation Systems Technical Manager. Um, our focus of my team is uh, basically cybersecurity, because it's part of CERT, obviously. But it's also um, focused on systems engineering best practices, uh, software assurance, the risk management framework, um, and how to build and uh, sustain secure systems. Hassan? I'm Hassan Yasser, Technical Manager of Secure Lifecycle Solutions Group under Secure Automation Directorate, and, which is in CERT division. So my team does engineering practices and product development based on SCI clients. While we are doing engineering work, we are improving and also increasing the DevOps awareness, which is practicing all DevOps principles and process. And also we are addressing the security needs of application requirements and from beginning to end. And that's our main goals and main practices. Great, thanks. And Will? And I'm Will Hayes. I'm the principal engineer on the Agile and Government team here. And my work is primarily with Department of Defense programs um, who are implementing Agile capabilities um, within the context of the DOD 5000 framework. And so we're helping acquirers as well as development organizations understand how to use Agile concepts uh, in that setting. Great. And since we have audience members who may not be familiar with all the terminology, can the three of you briefly give me a, a summary of what it means to talk about Agile and DevOps and RMF? And I'm going to start with Will. So with Agile, it's the notion of incrementally and iteratively building a system, starting with some prioritization process by which we take the hardest part or the most valuable part or some way of differentiating some small piece that should go first and quickly iterating and learning as that work happens so that subsequent development activities are informed by the outcomes of the early iterations. Actually, it's a good start. So I'm going to say DevOps is the extension of Agile, and right. continuation of process. So DevOps is a set of practices and principles that increase the communication and collaboration, mainly the IT operational folks. However, and as we know, the software development practice is requiring all other stakeholders as part of the development process, and mainly security folks so that's the, the DevOps is basically addressing all this communication and collaboration and also increasing automation amongst the team members. So we can implement more agile thinking, more agile process throughout the life cycle. Okay, great. And Tim? So RMS stands for Risk Management Framework. It's a NIST publication. Um, and basically it's the way in which the government, uh, different programs and agencies uh, get their authority to operate. Right, With any system, when a, when a program manager does trade between cost, schedule, quality, functionality, they're inheriting risk. And someone needs to accept that risk before it's transitioned into operations, especially like in the Department of Defense and, and the larger agencies. Um, and so this authority to operate construct is where an authorizing official accepts that risk, especially from a cybersecurity information assurance perspective. And so RMF is the process in which that is a current process in which those authority to operates are, are granted. Okay. So a lot of our uh, DOD client programs and collaborators have a historic experience with that certification and accreditation process where every three years you bring a compliance checklist to the certifying official um, and that at that point you're granted your authority to operate. And they ask us frequently, how do I jive the, the new RMF process with what we're trying to do to innovate with Agile and DevOps, where we're relying on small batches and regular frequent releases? Uh, so if you can uh, start us off talking a little bit about how RMF fits into that world. Right. So traditionally, the government uses it's called DIACAP. You can Google it. It's Department of Defense, Information Assurance. I think it's accreditation and certification. I think I did that acronym right. Not positive. But the idea there it was very much a three year, it was very much compliance based. And so with the NIST new standard, it's now risk as well as compliance kind of come together. Is how do I make that assessment? Um, because of that tra tradition of the every three year ATO and the annual reviews, that part has come with it. 
But RMF, if you read the material and you look at it, there's a construct built into it already, which is a, a continuous uh, reauthorization construct, where the authority, op the, the AO or authorizing official basically says that, you know, based on that initial assessment, I believe you have enough infrastructure in place to maintain the current set of risk that we've accepted um, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a minimal acceptable level, even though you're continuously making changes to the system, right? But that requires a lot of trust between the, author mm -hmm. the authorizing official as well as the program offices themselves in terms of that they have the right contract, they have the right things in place. Um, and that's really where the government's currently struggling is, is what's enough, where is enough inf infrastructure in place that, that as the person assuming the risk, the authorizing official, they trust the program office, right? They, and, and that's really at the crux is the issue. Right? But that's necessary in order to become more agile, to be able to get to this life cycle. And really, the only way to do that is through some automation, is through the DevOps constructs. I can bit add a little bit what Tim said. And I think we have to understand the problem, why it is important. Because first of all, risk security is based on the risk. If you know what type of risk you're dealing with it, then you can talk about the security related. Because the other things, if we are giving the a developer some talk about developer's perspective, so if a developer, they don't know really what they have to look at it, what are the requirements related to the risk and related to security? Because there are many controllers available. There are many things available. Which one they have to address it? As Tim mm -hmm. said, what is enough enough? And how are they going to do as a developer perspective that I have to look at it? And then sharing the risks amongst them. The other thing is also DevOps will help in the mindset, so which basically sharing the, all the information through the secret officials, which is creating a trust person, not program managers, is required. But also, a developer should write the code. And then, if there's a secret part of that code, which is basically giving a visibility to the either program manager offices or the information secret officials, and which is built in the system. But if it is manual process, there is no benefits. Basically, you can go and check it out. And then, main things we have that automation. That's the things the government is struggling right now. Not only for governments, I see almost any organization are required to be compliant for any compliance like HIPAA or SOAX or RMF in the OD context. They are struggling because it's all manual process. Somebody has to approve it personally. Somebody has mm -hmm. to say, yes, I assure that this system is already have the security controls on it and has passed the test. And I can assure that so I can release into production. So now, with the speed of Agile, with the speed of DevOps mindset, and how can we connect the requirements and then make it efficiently so we can release quickly? Right, and down that same path. Traditionally, DiaCap very much um, was an afterthought, right? I built the product, and then you come in and accredited, and you determine whether it's an issue, right? RMF is very much designed to be part of the entire software development life cycle, the entire acquisition life cycle, and that at the very beginning, before you even begin doing requirements or doing this stuff, you're supposed to think about the categorization of your system so you can figure out what type of, what are the requirements. And then that corresponds to, to various levels of controls, which is things like, you know, you need to use multi-factor authentication or you need to um, have specific types of configuration management techniques in place to ensure that your system only does what it's supposed to do and nothing else, right? Software assurance type. And I, I think what you're describing describes a larger trend we're seeing in agile implementations of shifting things to the left, whereas things that provide us a level of assurance have traditionally been viewed as something we do when everything else is done. That way we can have the full picture. Well, I think with the success we're seeing in agile development, um, we're seeing a, an ability to get that picture without everything being done and incrementally improve the amount of information that goes into such decisions. And certainly tools are a huge part of that. RMF, I think, adds another um, flavor to this in that there is a way of forward-looking uh, attitude to have a notion of where the risks are and maybe have that drive some of your choices in development. And I think that's a really exciting frontier for us. The one thing I really like, the RMF concept, it's a continuous process, actually. Mm -hmm. There's a six steps, a continuous process. So when you put RF in a site, if you look at the DevOps in Agile, we are looking for a continuous process as well. So something is moving along. We had the incremental mm -hmm. release, a continuous integration, continuous deployment, continuous delivery. So it's basically all about the continuous. Things is moving, like train is moving through the pipeline as application. Now RMF is basically another continuous process 
there's six steps in it. Yeah. You can add right. more to them. So if you get that map, the continuous process, the continuous application lifecycle, that's integration pieces. How, that's really important because we should really think about how can we integrate that process into the application lifecycle. We right. can increase the automations. We can add more right. security checks on it. Right, and then security checks, like, you know, it originally was manual because there was no tools out there, right? Now there's tools out there in the software, in the software assurance realm that really can say, can evaluate my software, determine, am, am I doing, using good coding standards? Am I, am I using a coding, am I writing code that makes my code more vulnerable to, to you know, hackers or malicious actors, right? There's other things that go is most software, most of people don't write all their software. Most of your software is a collection of libraries or other applications packaged together to solve a, a unique problem, right? Well, when you start taking in other people's products, you start taking in, how do, you, how do I ensure the integrity of that supply chain, right? Well, there are tools out there now that can say, you know, you're using that open source product. Well, this version has a known reported vulnerability in it. You shouldn't be using that version anymore. And it can automatically evaluate your software and provide those developers a type of feedback throughout their development lifecycle, not waiting until the developers finish. They've totally used that package. They've got everything working. And then at the end, under a traditional approach, a security person will come in and go, you can't use that version. And now I've got to redo all this work. Which is you have to get the reauthorization. And then I have to get reauthorization. I do, I got to, also got to retest everything from the functionality perspective, too, because I just switched out my library package. Right? And so give me that feedback as I develop. And I can make these changes when they're cheap. When I mean, it's basic and that quality is, stuff. That cost is a really big issue because most people, when they think about these quality assuring activities, they think of the cost and they think of the experience they've had when they're disruptive because they occur at the end when costs are steeper. Right. Now, with kind of a forward-looking approach, a continuous notion, we yeah. have the authority to invest in assuring quality when it's most beneficial. I think we don't have a luxury to wait six months to reassess our system because adversaries are using the similar sources our developer are using it. Yeah. It's that open source. It's keep growing a lot. If my developer are using open source tools and techniques for building application, and adversaries and the criminals are using the same tool stack. Yeah. How much we can quickly address our environment with using the principles and the WASP principles, then we can go back and assess it quickly because right. today we can write a really a secure application we are thinking, but tomorrow who's going to guarantee that the application will secure? Right. My it's library was secure today, but it's a known vulnerability tomorrow. How do I yep. immediately evaluate and, so and make those when updates? When it's popped up, how much quicker we can go and, and address that needs and, and update the patch or the, uh, fix the box and as quickly as possible. Right. And so the only way to do that is really through automation and, and embracing that. So sometimes in, in the agile parlance, we say we want to develop and deliver working high quality product before the user has a chance to change their minds. I think what you're talking about is we want to be able to deliver secure systems before our adversaries have the insight about how to get in. Right. If, you don't, if you don't fix the system, it will be a zero-day vulnerable. It doesn't matter. It has been released three months ago or four months ago. Today, at the moment, you are vulnerable if you don't change. Right. And even if I know about the vulnerability, if I have a long accreditation package, I could fix the problem, but I can't get my authority to operate, so I can't actually release my more secure release. And a lot of these programs, too, there are many systems that contribute to the overall performance of the program, mm -hmm. and each of those subsystems has the potential to need an authority to operate. So simulation labs and other places where we do field testing, there's ATO considerations there as well. And the, the network that's provided by an ongoing attention to these issues is much more powerful than trying to fix individual blocks at the expense of time. Right. Yeah. And, and to me, like, you know, part of, like, you know, we talk about the rework and things of that nature, software assurance, um, defects, security issues, vulnerabilities, right? Studies have shown time and time again that if I can remove a defect early in the software development lifecycle, it's exponentially cheaper than waiting to the end. Uh, vulnerabilities is just a very specific type of defect, right? And, and so the same principles apply. There is a return on investment. It's money saved if you just invest in the tools and get those defects out when I inject them, not you know, months or years later. I think it reinforces the notion, too, that um, good quality, high security comes about from careful attention to disciplined processes. It's not addition of some magic sauce at some point in the timeline. It's doing things the way we're supposed to do them as we know them as professionals. I think there's a misunderstanding about the Agile and DevOps. People are thinking it's just a chaos, it's just a cowboy programming, it's a mm -hmm. random things. 
Actually, Agile and DevOps is bringing principles, process. There is a discipline work. Doesn't mean it's just wild things. You can do the wild stuff, whatever you want it, however yeah. you want it. When I change the random, it's not. There, there, it's not basic. It's just the the people are thinking it's constant changes, but there is a behind. There's a science behind. There is a process behind it. Yeah. And then mainly for DevOps, there is a principles about the, the integrated platform. And then there is a requirement to focus. The developer has to the commit messages linked to the. Uh, case management system, probably there's an information related over there. So there's a discipline in the DevOps work as well. And also automation is also requiring discipline. So it's actually... Yeah. I actually think mind. it's more discipline. My yeah. experience with DevOps, yes. Agile folks, is it's more discipline because if you don't do it right, it's so much more amplified that you're doing it wrong. If you don't do it right in the one time, and then you cannot automate it. If you make it the right, and you can make automation, so that means guaranteed it's going to work all the time. Uh, there's right. no way to release working code every two yeah. weeks unless right. you do it correctly, right. and working code that meets our security standards even more. The tools really help us to be disciplined with less overhead, really. I completely agree, but if you have the tools, if there is no process, and then it's not yeah. gonna, tool is not going to work either because yeah. you have to have a mission yeah. understanding. A tool with a fool is, a a fool is still a fool, yeah. right? I mean, <laughs> it's it's still true for any tool, right? And so to maximize the, the, the tooling, you have to have a plan, you have to have a process, you have to have a, right. a consistent usage of those tools. Um, and it's really true with the DevOps concept. Tools should tools. be compatible with your environment, tools should be compatible with the technological stack, should be available, tools should be uh, enabler for the people to make the process happen. Right? I think one of the ways Eileen always talks about it is how do we have a low drag uh, approach right. to this? And I think that's a, a nice model to think yep. about. Yep. So I'm going to uh, shift us a little bit. Tim, can you explain to our viewers a little bit about how the ATO process works? Right. So um, focus on RMF approach way of doing it, right? There's six steps that you refer to. First step is categorization. It's where you, you say, what type of system do I have, right? And NIST has a whole process for figuring out what categorization it is based on the different types of data that the system handles or, or processes, um, and then the risk to the, to, to, to the organization. You figure, your, figure out your categorization, and based on that, there's a whole list, there's hundreds of actual controls that have been published by the mm -hmm. NIST process. And it's anywhere it's from thou shalt have a policy towards you know, account management to you, know, you need to have multi-factor authentication to you have to have a uh, you know emergency response uh, practice, right? It's 800-53A, so 53s. <laughs> right. There's all kinds of things. Yes. But I'm just saying, like, the, there's, like, there's hundreds of controls, and it covers a lot of different things. And traditionally, what will happen is, based on the categories of your system, it maps to a specific set of uh, controls. And as a minimum, you inherit those controls. There's also additional things, um, like uh, personal information, PII type of stuff. Um, that gives you additional controls above and beyond the core controls mapped to the categorizations. And so then what happens is someone goes through all these controls that are applicable to my system, and they have to document and, and explain how they're addressing that control in their system, right? And, and, and they go step by step, one by one, and then they all, so once they've explained how they did it, then an independent person has to come in and go, is the system actually doing what you said it's going to do? And traditionally, they'll do it very manually. They'll go, this control says this. Show me in the system that you're doing that, right? And that's really, you know, at the heart of it is, is very manually intensive. That's why they only do it every few. They, they, they do a full ATO every three years, and they do like an annual review. Mm -hmm. It's kind of traditional what most programs do because it's so much manually intensive work, right? Instead, it should be, this is what you say you're going to do. I ran some automated testing, and <coughs> here's the automated test results that demonstrate that I've met this control. Right? You can see how much quicker, as, a, as an auditor, I can just see a dashboard. I can just see the results of these tests, assuming that I agree that these tests do reinforce those controls. While there, like, again, there is still some manual controls that I'm going to have to review annually, like policy type of ones. But that's really, in general, less than half of them. Almost over half of them can be automated. So yep. is there an analogy to test-driven development um, that you could draw there? There's kind of a, a risk-driven development framework that could come about if we do it this I way, right? That's exactly risk-driven development. So a couple of things I would like to, Tim, you said a very key word, documentation. Mm -hmm. So the biggest concern, and especially for ATO process, what I see so far based on my engagements, people need documentation. 
that the system is going to create documentation. There is no way we can stop the documentation. It's impossible. But why the, why the system should create documentation for us? So what the documentation is required, basically, we're looking for the security controllers. Right. A53 depends on application. So all this documentation can be audit generated throughout the development pipeline. Right. And that's what I meant by a dashboard, right? Yes. It very much is, yeah. is if, I know what the, if I know what the controls are that I have to meet, I can write testing, test automated case test cases, write mm -hmm. scripts to validate that. But I can map this script goes with that control. And when that script runs, every time I check in my changes, continuous integration, continuous testing yeah. constructs from DevOps, it generates the test results. Then and when I be, fail, i got to fix it now. And this can be demoed to an audience of people who have these considerations. See, if you take right. out the security aspect right now, almost every industrial practitioners, whoever doing DevOps work, it's only doing automation for testing, mm -hmm. like a functional testing or any type of right. ability type of testing. But those same tools, those same tools see, that do functional testing right. can do security checking but too. The issue is, the issue is I said, there's no define security requirements as part of function requirements. When mm -hmm. it's defined, and say, here is my function related requirements, here's a security portion related to that function requirements, here is applied security controllers will be part of my function requirements, which is basically the first categorization of RMF and right. ATO process. Now the key is, how can we document that process? So if you have a, a fully integrated pipeline, DevOps pipeline, and software development pipeline, basically, all these components like the wiki pages or the source repositories and right. case management system, and then continuous integration can this deploy, which comes after that. So if you automatically test all these things against the cases that you created, against the, any test cases has been defined, then you assure that has been tested and passed it, and then get the report directly. So still human will be in the loop, but the system will generate the documentation, require the person to say yes or no. Yep. And then, then, it, then it's much more or less manual intensive. It's, it's, I just got to review the outputs. Right. I don't have to actually perform all the manual validations, right? And in terms of requirements, I mean, that's really the beauty of RMF versus the die cap process, mm -hmm. right? RMF, I, if I know what the categorization is, and categorization is supposed to be pre-milestone B, mm. right? So it should actually be part of the contract. They should know what they are, at least initially, before contract award, right, in the defense acquisition right. process. Yeah. So. The developers have the requirements spec. They have the, the key is, is the, the developers have to be given them as the requirements. The developers have to understand what they mean, and they got to work with some security folks, and that's the ops part of DevOps. Yep. So I'm going to play the developer's role. Let's see if I'm going to write any application, and I have to look at my Scrum Masters or the, my Agile coach <laughs> to say, hey, you have to include this. That's the Agile that comes to the picture, right? Yep. Whoever running the show. So one of the things we like to talk about in, in training classes is, you know, you many people work in an environment where we never have the time to do it correctly, but we always find the time to do it over. Right. If we take the RMF on board at the outset, we're not doing it over. We're making the correct path, the easy path, using the kind of tooling you're talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. And really, like, from an agile perspective, it's always what's the minimally viable system functionality, right? Well, you can have all the greatest functionality in the world, but if I can't get an ATO, it's useless. Yeah. So, so, so by definition, yeah. by definition, it's no longer viable. It is the min part of that minimal viable system is security. And I think there are a lot of practitioners in this space um, who um, are accustomed to being the bad news providers at the end of the pipeline, and to hear that viability of the system is something that really hinges on this. And to be able to operationalize that logic, I think is a huge win for us. Right. Mm -hmm. Actually, I want to add one more thing, all these things. Like the, one of the requirements, I believe, the secret of folks didn't know what is the dependencies libraries that's coming to my pipeline, not only for application-related functionality-wise, but also other requirements. So one of the good principles of DevOps is bring, comes into the picture, which is infrastructure as a code pieces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you scripted all the dependencies, all the libraries, as part of the application package, these things is not changing every time. But if you keep the versioning, like instead of giving a word documentation, keep as a, a code by itself, you can diff it. Instead yeah. of going for every library over and over again for re approval process, mm -hmm. then you just look for the what are the new libraries I'm going to use, just get approval for the pieces only, which is incremental approval for the dependencies. So the big, big mistake I see so far, looking for the configuration management, when you get approval, 
And I, I remember that I gave a couple of years ago, I gave the huge list to one of our clients, which is more than 150 libraries. It took months to get that approval. I said, why don't we give the only incremental version? They're not used to have the incremental version. Mm -hmm. So next time, we gave them actually code. Literally, we gave them a code. We said, here is our basically chef script and, and compatible environment. We said, you can diff it. What we gave it to you six years ago, and we have only the new version of such 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 libraries. And we got the approval process only for changes that we are writing based on the diff. We are sure that because it comes to the trust, right? right? We are sure that we are really didn't change anything. It is basically code running by itself, and we're running, so you can compare it. And then only the changes we got the approval actually dropped at one day. We right. dropped the code. We, they know that which version has been modified in terms of libraries, and they, the next day they get back to this, yes, it's approved. You can push into the production environment. Right, and that's really the power of infrastructure as right. code, right? It's, yeah, that's, it's that's because, was, because your, your, your script is your documentation. Right. And by definition, my documentation is up to, to date because the script won't work unless it's right. But, right, so which is, which is verification, isn't it? So I right. verify that it's going to work. And yeah. It is not somebody's going to have to see that. I think there's right. another benefit to the mindset that comes from viewing infrastructure as code. It forces you to be much more specific and much more exact about what it is you are or are not doing. That mindset is really essential for all of these efforts that want to shift left the things that have typically occurred at the end of the life cycle. Often, it's not clear to the people that are um, doing the work earlier in the life cycle what that activity is about. And as we get much more conscious about it, Shifting left becomes much easier. I think shifting left is good because operational folks already using that type of configuration management system. They already have the scripting environment. They're using it already. So why don't we use that environment, which all they're using in terms of the scripting, pass it to the left as much as possible, yeah. really carry out the developers, including maybe going far left and adding architecture pieces and going back to the acquisition pieces and ask the requirements up front. What goes in the RFP, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, right. that actually brings me to my next question. Um, if I'm a brand new program manager, uh, what do I do now? I'm new to RMF. My contractor, my engineering organization are going to be using uh, agile and DevOps approaches. What should I do now? Hmm. It's a tough question, isn't it, Seems. Well, <laughs> uh, do you want to start it? Yeah, start? I'll start it. So the, definitely the program manager should understand their development environments first and what environments they are working on it. Because the, it's really important to understand the technical needs and the program needs. And you can start over there and establish a good platform as infrastructure-wise and platform-wise. Mm -hmm which enables the peoples and developers and security folks and program managers and all the stakeholders able to see that platform and then developer able to use that platform effectively, actively, so we can add automation on top of it. I think it's a mind shift a little bit from a program manager perspective. Traditionally, um, they take the DIACAP or the RMF stuff and go, who's my security specialist here? It's your problem. Right? The reality is, is it's an engineering problem. How do I engineer a secure system? How do I build a secure system? They should be taking the RMF and go, engineers, it's your problem. Security person, you're responsible for validating that they're, they're building me a secure system. And it's a very huge mind shift. But that's really what a program manager should be focused on, is the RMF is the system engineer's problem or the, so the lead software engineer's problem. And the security folk is there to make sure that they understand what the controls mean. They're the expert in security, but it's not the security person responsibility to implement and, and build the secure system. They're the validator, they're, the, they're answering questions. The developers need to own the problem, they need to solve the problem. And so places where we're seeing Agile be successful, um, what we're seeing is people are being brought to the table. So I might have been part of an operational test that typically occurs at the end. I'm coming up at the very beginning of the planning process and understanding what's going to be the impact to the infrastructure I need to operate mm -hmm. when we have these kinds of groups of capabilities coming down the pipeline. RMF becomes another um, system that constrains that process towards success. And so the earlier we can get those people involved, the earlier we can introduce those concepts, the better we're going to optimize the whole pipeline as opposed to optimizing some piece of it or optimizing it with respect to some subset of attributes we care about. We want to have um, as many of those things simultaneously contributing to the decision making we're doing at each point along the way. You're saying basically the problem is not my problem, it's not your problem, it's our, our problem. problem. Our problem. Yeah. That's a big mind shift change, actually. It's our problem. 
So in five years, 10 years, what does awesomeness look like for the risk management framework and Agile and DevOps? I think all programs have a continuous authority to operate. There's no such thing as a three-year ATO event or a one-year check-the-box event. You know, it's I follow the, the the good acquisition agile processes, and I build it in, and so it's it's a non-event, right? That you know, security should be a non-event because it should always be there, right? Because I don't have a, a, a minimally viable program if it's not a product, if it's not secure. So a clean bill of health shouldn't be an exciting thing. It should just be normal. Right. Mm. What I see for future and things are changing a lot when I compared my background 25 years ago. Now where we are right now, to link up to looking for another 10 years, the programming concept is keep changing. So it's going to be more about the configuration, more about automation. So eventually people will write only the configuration script. Eventually the developer will just mm. do kind of like a Lego, Lego type of attitude and behavioral things. So in that context, automation is a key principle because it's going to be all configuration. It's going to be all about integration, how much quicker we can adapt our system quickly, then we'll be winners, which is looking at automation. That's the future I see that. I don't see, maybe robots are going to write the code eventually, or the system is going to write by itself, but we're just going to be connected. They've been saying that for decades. Like, quite I mean, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> but it is going that direction right now, I mean, yeah. especially for automation, like there's a chat bots and chat ups in, in the DevOps world, right. and it's basically, it's your, you can start up this continuous integration server with the one command line through the chat window, which is, it's getting there then you can get the result back to your chat environment from the system, which is automated again. Right. So, and so you can really add automation as all these tooling perspectives. So I would add another dimension of ambition for us, if I may. Um, I think the ecosystem that we're concerned with, where our, pro our products operate, um, we want to expand the scope of that ecosystem we include. In particular, I'd like to see hardware, firmware, middleware, those kinds of things be considered in this framework. And right now, there's not a lot of good solutions for how do we do rapid, frequent integrations that involve changes in hardware. Software is perceived, not always accurately, to be somewhat easier because it's zeros and ones on a machine. But why can't we grow our focus here? And part of that, the hardware piece is, from, a, from a, an a, a assurance perspective, it's a huge issue, right? The, the, the days of the trusted foundries are no longer really existed. Um, and so how do I ensure that you know, the, the, the chips and the capacitors, there's nothing hidden in there, yeah. right? And also, a lot of chips now, they're actually programmed. Or so they're not even, way. or they're developed by programs, yeah, right? right? Yeah. You know, because most chip manufacturers, they don't actually manually design the chip. They use software, they put requirements, they do diagrams, they design, and it auto generates how that chip should look and how that chip should be mapped. Mm -hmm. How do you assure that software that builds that hardware? Yeah. Maybe you'll all right. join me for a future conversation about exploring this in the, the hardware and embedded systems world. And we can bring all our children because they will be doing this work. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, thank you all for joining us today to talk about this work. Uh, for our audience members, we will provide links to the resources mentioned today in the transcript for this podcast. This podcast is available on the SCI website at sei.cmu.edu forward slash podcasts on the Carnegie Mellon University iTunes U site and the SCI's YouTube channel. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to us at info.sei.cmu.edu. Thanks. <laughs>